This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is now a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each episode I interview authors about their latest works or others in the book world about their roles, what those roles entail, and the books they love. For more book recommendations, check out my earlier episodes and my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Thoughts from a Page. Thanks to Maggie Garza of HTX Real Estate Group for sponsoring my podcast. Today, I posted a special Patreon bonus episode where Elizabeth Barnhill and I talk about book pairings, nonfiction and fiction books that can be read together to enhance the reading experience of both books. I hope you'll check it out. I recently participated in a really fun group read organized by Kelly of Kelly Hook Reads Books and Ivana of Beaches Books and Bubbles for one of my favorite books of the year, Songs in Ursa Major by Emma Brody. Kelly and Ivana are coordinating another one for October, and this time they are reading Bad Muslim Discount. The neat thing about these buddy reads is that the author joins in for the final discussion. I really enjoyed participating in the Songs in Ursa Major one, and I'm looking forward to October's buddy read as well. I have a link to their post about the Bad Muslim Discount read in my show notes if you want to learn more about it. Today, I am interviewing Jane Ayaro about The Sweetest Remedy. Jane was born in Nigeria and immigrated to Canada at the age of 12. She has a journalism degree from the University of Toronto and works as a communications specialist in Ontario, Canada. When she isn't writing, she's watching Homecoming for the hundredth time and trying to match Beyonce's vocals to no avail. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Before we get started, I am really excited to tell you about my latest sponsor, The Young Center, here in Houston. The Young Center is delighted to present author and producer Delia Efron on October 5th at their 2021 Fall Benefit, Who's in Your Inbox? Delia Efron talks about life, change, and the relationships that matter. You know Delia's work. With her sister Nora, she co-wrote You've Got Mail and co-produced Sleepless in Seattle. Delia's newest book, coming out in April, is Left on Fifth, A Second Chance at Life. In it, she describes her story of falling in love after the death of her husband and sister, being diagnosed with cancer, and living through it all with humor and grace. To register, go to younghouston.org and click on Delia Efron. I've included a link in the show notes. You will get $10 off your ticket when you write thoughts from a page in the notes. I am personally planning to attend online, and I hope to see you there as well. Welcome, Jane. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, and I'm so excited we're getting to speak again. Me too. So why don't we start out with you telling me a little bit about The Sweetest Remedy. Okay, so The Sweetest Remedy is about um, Hannah Bailey, a biracial woman. She's part white and part Nigerian. She's never had a, a relationship with her Nigerian father, so she's a bit clueless about that part of her identity. When, she, when her father dies, she's invited to Nigeria for the funeral. So she decides to go, and while there she meets her siblings for the first time. And she connects with them, even though it's a bit difficult at first. She also meets someone who's um, connected to her family and they develop a romantic relationship. And Hannah just learns a lot about herself and about her father, her culture, her family, and determines who she wants to be. She grows throughout the book from discovering all these different things about herself. And her half-siblings don't know about her until she arrives, isn't that right? Exactly. It's kind of a mess when she does arrive. Well, I was so curious about the whole story, where you came up with the idea, how you decided on the format to tell it, setting it in Nigeria. So do you want to talk a little bit about first where the idea came from and then setting the book in Nigeria? Sure. Well, I had kind of a loose idea for my second novel. It was something like this about a girl who connects with her father, but um, it wasn't quite solid. I was watching, re-watching one of my favorite Nigerian movies called Chief Daddy, and the missing parts of the idea I already had just kind of clicked together. It's a movie and it's about um a family in Nigeria, a wealthy family, who all come together after the patriarch dies. And I thought it was just a very chaotic movie with just a lot of big different characters. And that hugely inspired The Sweetest Remedy. And I thought it would be, I thought the only place to base it was Nigeria. It never occurred to me to base it anywhere else. I love Nigeria and the setting and how there are different settings, um, places that look incredibly wealthy and others that are middle class. And I just wanted to bring all that to life. 
Well, and I think that the interesting thing about this book is that it portrays a part of Nigeria that I think people aren't as familiar with. I thought that was interesting. I felt I learned a lot. And I think that will be a wonderful thing for readers as they're reading the book. Yeah, I think so too. I, I thought that was that was very important for me to do, to just show an aspect of Nigeria that people aren't familiar with or don't even know exists. So I enjoyed doing that. And what about research? I know you've spent time in Nigeria in the past, but the last you know couple of years have been a tricky time to travel. So did you just rely on what you've known from your prior visits, do research on the internet, or how did you handle all of that? So I came to Canada when I was around like 11 or 12, I think 11. And I haven't been back since. So I did go back in 2019 at the end of the year for my uncle's wedding. And um, that was my first time there after all these years. So I, I basically experienced everything again anew. And um, things seemed familiar. And a lot of things didn't seem familiar. So I based a lot of my research on my experiences and some of what I saw in movies, a combination of both. Well, and I think when you visit some place like that where you hadn't been in so long, everything is fresh. It kind of gives you a new perspective. So writing on it from that perspective probably really helped you because you noticed all sorts of things you wouldn't have maybe noticed if it was a place you'd been to a lot in recent times. Yeah, exactly. I, I kind of observed it more carefully. You know, I didn't want to let anything slip away. So I put a lot of attention. What about the format? So Hannah tells the story a lot of the time, but you also incorporate a variety of other point of views. How did that come about? I think that was an accident. I had like, uh, in the first draft, I had a, a lot of characters that I took out in this final book. But I thought it would be so cool if I knew what was going on, if readers knew what was going on in their head and give them their own story. I wanted it to still be mostly Hannah's story. But with a book with so many characters, I thought it would be unfair if I didn't at least put a spotlight on some of them. I liked that because I felt like it helped me learn a little bit more about that character from their own perspective versus just from Hannah's. And it obviously seems to be resonating with readers because I hopped on Goodreads before the interview just to kind of see what everyone was saying. And a number of people commented on how much they liked that. Oh, yeah, I'm happy. I was actually a little nervous because it's not like it's a consistent um, back and forth between different characters. It is mostly Hannah's and then a little drop of other point of views over throughout the book. So I'm glad people, some people like it. They definitely do. Tell me about writing your second book versus writing your first book. Did you find the experience to be very different? Did you find it very similar? Was it a mixture of both? How did that go for you? It was completely different. Ties That Tether, my first book, was in first person. And I connected to that book so deeply because it felt it was very personal to me, my experiences and everything like that. The Sweetest Remedy was third person, and it was a bit difficult sometimes to navigate that. And it's not a story I can say I relate to greatly. I just wanted to tell a very interesting story. I don't have a personal connection with Hannah or her circumstance. So it was a bit difficult at first writing a character that I didn't connect to or have similar experiences to. That's interesting because I guess, as you said, Ties It Tether was a much more personal story. So as you're writing, you're really thinking, okay, this is how I handled it or what I thought or, you know, you kind of in, in put yourself into the story, but very different than when you're writing a story about Hannah, where it's something you haven't really experienced at all. Yeah. And I feel like for in that situation, I had to pretend I was an actress, you know, and act like I was Hannah, feeling what she was feeling. I mean, I've always wanted to be an actress, even though I don't really have the talent for it. So I just work on that when I'm writing and pretend to be my characters. So that helps. I like that. And that's so fun that you've always wanted to be an actress. Yeah, I'm a terrible actress, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're probably being too hard on yourself. I doubt you're terrible. <laughs> but that's a fun way to look at it, to try to kind of put yourself into the role of Hannah. Yeah. Well, tell me about being selected as Book of the Month. I have to tell you, I was thrilled to pieces when I saw the September selections. And I was like, oh, Jane's book is in there. So that's wonderful. Congratulations. And I want to hear all about it. Thank you so much. I was honestly so, so, so thrilled. I was thrilled at first for my first book, Ties That Tether, that it was picked, but I really didn't expect it this year. It didn't occur to me. I was just going about my business when I got the news, and I, I'm, I feel really blessed that they wanted me to uh, wanted to pick another of my book. 
and um, it's been a great experience. I love the fact that it was released a few weeks earlier than um, the actual publish, publication date because it just gives people some chance to get the word out there and read and share their views about it, and I love that. It definitely does. It puts it on people's radars before the pub date even occurs. Yeah. Well, I hope you told them after being selected for both books for Book of the Month that you just expect that to happen for every book going forward. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. That would be incredible. <laughs> you tell them you've set the stage. So now I'm expecting every time I write a book, you will select it. I feel like I should let them know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> you should. <laughs> well, how did you come up with the title for this one? Oh, it was so, so hard. I finished the entire book and I thought that a title would come to me, but it didn't. And I sat on it. I sent the book to my editor and I still didn't have a title. The Sweetest Remedy, I kept reading the last line of the book. And I just felt like she mentioned the word remedy. And I just kind of put the sweetest in there. And it just kind of had a nice ring to it and it warmed my heart. And I was like, okay, that's it. <laughs> it wasn't like something huge. It was just, I really struggled. But when it came, it felt right. I always love hearing how titles came about because either it's been the title from the very beginning or it seems like there's just so much conversation and brainstorming, but it sounds like yours was kind of in the middle, not at the beginning, but then you came up with it and everybody was just good with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, and tell me about the cover. I always think your covers are beautiful and so eye-catching and really representative of your story. How did this one come about? Thank you. This cover, like the title, was difficult. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Whereas um, Ties That Tether, my first book, was very easy. This one, I don't know what it was, but it was a bit difficult. I don't think I knew what I wanted going in. I didn't have an exact image. So we went back and forth a bit. And um, I feel like at the end, it, it was the right cover. And I'm very happy with it. I always find when it comes to graphics like that, that I can't explain what I want but I can definitely say what I don't want. So if I've asked someone to do something either for the podcast or the literary salon or whatever it is, and they come back, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, (laughs) that's not what I wanted. But I couldn't say up front what I did want. It's hard sometimes to articulate that. Yeah. And I did it a lot. I told uh, my editor a lot of what I don't want. And we went back and forth for the longest time. But um, it all came together. They were very patient with me, which I really appreciate. That is wonderful because it is your book and you don't want to look at the cover every single time and think, oh, I can't stand the cover for this book that I put so much time and effort and work into. Exactly. I would have been miserable. But every time I look at it, I smile. And the two books look really good together. So I really like it too because I love it when covers complement each other. I just think it kind of is a good marketing strategy for you, kind of creates a brand. Yeah, for sure. Well, are you working on anything at the present that you would like to share with me? Um, I just turned in my third book called Worth Having. That title was incredibly easy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I tell you, it's either super easy or super hard. Of course. Um, I came up with that title way before I even finished the book. So, and um, it's, it's about, oh, it's a romance. It's, a, it's not like The Sweetest Remedy where the romance is just a, maybe a subplot. It's a romantic novel and it's about childhood lovers who have a relationship when they were younger in Nigeria, but they're split apart. And there's a bit of superstition in there because Nigerians are very superstitious people. And so I threw a bit of that in there. I still don't know how to explain this book quite yet. So you're getting a bit of a mess right now, but... (laughs) That's okay. You know, and that's so interesting on mentioning the romance because I'm not a huge romance reader. I enjoy them when I do read them. But clearly, there's sort of a whole genre out there or or following out there. And some of them really want the romance to be kind of the main part of the story, where other people just enjoy the story regardless of kind of where the romance fits in. I find that very interesting. Yeah, I've I've been tagging a few reviews where people say um, the romance isn't, it's like a subplot. I wish it was more. And others say I really like the way it, it is. I... I don't know. I really find it hard to read a book that doesn't even have a little bit of a romance because I like just even a dash of romance. But I I just feel like everyone's preference is different. But in my third book, the romance is going to be at the center of the story, the only story, in fact. I do think you're right that some of it is expectation. You know, some people want solid romance. Some people want a story with some romance. So I think it just really varies. And no matter what, you're not going to make everybody happy. 
I've really learned to deal with that and just move on. (laughs) Yeah, I think you just have to do that, especially these days, because I feel like there's so much external stuff happening that people are unhappy anyway, and it just comes out in the strangest ways. So you have to sometimes realize it's probably nothing to do with you at all. It's just every other crazy thing that's happening. I completely agree. Yeah. Well, what about what you've read recently that you really liked? Well, I wouldn't say this is a recent read, but I'm going to reread it again. I really love this book. It's called The Secret Lives of the Four Wives by Lola Sheungi. It's by a Nigerian author, and it's about a polygamous family in Nigeria. And the secrets that the wives keep, and the secrets are huge. It's a juicy story. It's very sad, but also strangely funny at times. And I read it a a few months ago, and I can't get it out of my system. And I believe it's going to be a Netflix show at some point. Yeah. I love that all of these books are being turned into Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime TV series, because it really does extend the life of the book. Yes, I love that. Anything else that you would recommend? I recently read Instructions for Dancing by Nicola Yoon, and um, she really does know how to break people's hearts in her books. (laughs) She does. (laughs) So that book was really beautiful and heartbreaking as well. I also read another YA novel called Happily Ever Afters by Elise Bryan. And it's just such a sweet story that warms your heart. And I love it so much. It's a romance. So those are three book recommendations. I'm not familiar with the last one, but it sounds cute. But I love Nicola Yoon. I haven't read this book, but my daughters loved her first two. And we actually heard her speak one time at a teen book con. She was fantastic. Oh, she writes wonderfully. My favorite of hers is The Sun is Also a Star. What a magical book that is. I know. Her books are just beautiful. Yes, I agree. Well, Jane, I can't wait for everybody to read The Sweetest Remedy, and I so appreciate your coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast again. Thank you so much. It was, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. You as well. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access some fabulous bonus content. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed today can be purchased at the Conversations from a Page bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks to Maggie Garza of HTX Real Estate Group and Young Center Houston for sponsoring this episode. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm Allison Holland, host of the Kennedy Dynasty podcast. Equipped with a microphone and a long-term fascination of the Kennedy family, I am joined by an incredible cast of experts, friends, and guests to take you on a fun, relaxed, yet informative journey through history and pop culture. From book references to fashion to philanthropy to our modern expectations of the presidency itself, you'll see that there is so much more to Kennedy than just JFK or conspiracy theories. Join me for the Kennedy Dynasty podcast.